Good morning. Uh, could we together pray the prayer of illumination, which is on the second page of your bulletin? Together, please. O oh Lord, our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Uh, the scripture reading for today is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 19 to 26. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Judah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up, and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to divide Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from Texas in Israel. David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is the word of the Lord. Okay. Season finale, okay. Okay, epic okay. finish, must watch, okay, okay. must watch. Okay, okay. calm down, Final season. calm down, yeah. calm down. Calm yeah. down. Right, are you calm? Yeah. Okay, ready? Hey. Hey. It's not working. What's going on? It's not working. Ah, uh, you're so sweet one. Do you, do you change the batteries or not? Uh, I don't remember. Okay, no. okay, tell you what, since you're very eager to watch the show, mm? get up, just go change the batteries, then we'll, we'll all enjoy the show, okay? Hi yo. change batteries. Why do I have to change the batteries? It's all the remote's fault. And why can't the engineers make something that can, you know, change the batteries by themselves? No, no, no. Okay, come on, it's 20. Okay, 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 that's not the point. That's not the point. Okay, relax. Yeah. How much time remaining? Three more minutes. Better Three minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, tell you what. There's a very easy solution to all this. Mm. Just get up, walk to the TV, and switch it on manually. <laughs> easy. Alamak. You want me to get up, walk all the way there, Yes. And push one button so that I can watch my season finale. Yes. <sighs> so much work. And it's all the... Why should I walk over, all over there? It's all the remote's fault that I cannot watch my TV show. Okay. You, you go watch. Uh, you go turn it on. Go turn it on for me. Why do I have to switch on? It was your suggestion. It's you the go. remote's job to switch on the TV. <sighs> One more minute, lah. Just try to do something. Hi, this stupid remote. Why can't you know, brand new also? You know, come on. Uh. No, it's really not working. Uh, no more time already, lah. You see, lah. 
So all this stupid remote. And then you also, what kind of husband are you? I regret marrying you already lah. Hey, what did I do? You see lah? Thanks to you, now my relationship with my wife is broken. Thank you very much. I'm out of here. I think those two need counselling lah. Do you think so? <laughs> my goodness. Ouch. <laughs> okay. Sometimes life is like that, right? You know, sometimes you can get so caught up with the problems. You can just get so caught up with the situation that even though there are solutions, but yet because we're just so caught up with the difficulties and the problem in life, we just feel so sucked into it that even the solutions may be right in front of us, we don't see it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to deal with life and the issues of life or the situations in life that come out. So please take out your sermon notes with me as we prepare to listen to God's Word. And we have children's sermon notes. So the children, today is the first time. You're just trying it out. If you don't have it, go and get it from the ushers. And uh, before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Oh, wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and all the honor. And Lord, this morning we ask for your Spirit to come and speak to us, to come and minister to us. <coughs> Lord, help us to hear from you what you want to say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you like to play board games or card games? How many like to play card games? You know, uh, you know there's one card game. Actually, it's a board game, but it's more a card game called Cluedo. You all know familiar with this game? Cluedo. You all played before? Okay, you know, I, I got this for my wife's birthday a couple of years back, and I tell you, it's difficult to find. You can't barely find Cluedo nowadays. I have to go online to buy the game and to just, just, just to give it to her because she wanted that game so badly. And one thing we realized when we played that game is this. I think I, I found out that I'm pretty good at that game. And my, the rest of my family, they're not so good. You see, Cluedo is like this. You're given a bunch of cards, and based on the cards you have, you're supposed to ask questions and find out who the murderer is, what the murder weapon is, and who and where the murder took place. Very simple, right? So it's a game of deduction. And no matter what cards are given, even though I got the worst cards, somehow I can win. I always win. And even at one point it came so at one point it came, I won. In fact, by the third question, I already know the answer already. But because I didn't want to show off, I pretend I didn't know and let them continue playing and playing and playing and playing until finally in the end I gave the answer. And I realized one thing. You know, it's, it's not a matter of what cards are dealt to you. It doesn't matter. You know, sometimes I get good cards, sometimes I get bad cards, sometimes I get lousy cards. But it doesn't matter what cards are dealt to you. It's the matter is how you play those cards, how you play the game. It doesn't matter what you get in life. But the question is, how you deal with it? And that's what life is all about. You know, it's not the situation. It's not the financial problem that comes. It's not the death that you face in your family. It's not the sicknesses that you face. It's not to say you have difficult children or rebellious children or you have difficult in-laws or mother-in-laws that kill, that, that, that drive the life, out, suck the lives out of you. It's not a matter whether you have difficult bosses or you have difficult co-workers. The issue is, how do you play the cards that are dealt to you in your life. And that's what matters most. And how you play those cards, how you see those cards. If you see the cards as the lousiest you'll ever get, you have lost the game even before it began. But if you see those cards as opportunities, as a challenge, it will bring confidence and it will bring hope. And it all depends on how you see things. And this morning, we're going to talk about that. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 22, this is a very important verse. It's on top of your notes. Let's all read this together. It's on the screen. Okay, let's all read this together. One, two, go. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. The lamp of your body is the eye. No, Jesus is not talking about your eye as in your eyeball. You know, that white color thing with the black circle in the center. He's not talking about your eyeball. But what Jesus is saying is what you see, how you see things. And how you see things, let's be honest, you don't see with your eyes, you know. You see, your eyes are just optical lenses that allows light to go through to project an image. What you see is what your brain 
interprets that image, and that's what you see. It's not what you don't see with your eyes, actually. You see with your mind, with the way you look at things in life. And that's what it's saying. And we're talking about your perspective, how you see things, how you view your life, how you view the situation around you. And that is what we're talking about. It's talking about your perspective. And therefore, if the lamp of your body is your perspective, if therefore your perspective is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your perspective is bad, and you see things badly, then your whole body will be full of darkness. Because everything you see, everywhere you see everything in its worst form, in its negative form, and you'll be in darkness. And that's why our perspective is very important. Your perspective will either bring things up, or will, will cause you to succeed, will cause you to be a life giver, or your perspective will cause you to bring things down and cause you to bring decay and sadness and discouragement and despair wherever you go. There was this play in Broadway in the 1930s 30s called A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. It was a very famous play. It was about a destitute African-American family on the south side of Chicago. And the play started with the mother waiting to receive a life insurance because the father, the, the wife, has, the, the father has just died. So the mother was living with her, her son and his family and the mother's daughter. So brothers and sisters, they were living together and they were waiting for this life insurance. $10,000 at that time was huge money. And so while they were waiting for this uh, check from the, from the insurance, their daughter, Bernetta, the daughter, was hoping that she could use the money to help get her into medical school. The mother, on the other hand, was hoping to use that money so that they can move out of the slums to a better neighbourhood so that the children would have a better future than to be living in the, in the midst of gangsters and the scums. Their son, however, Walter, Walter, wanted to use the money to make more money so that everyone can have their dream. So somewhere in the line, he managed to convince his mother to allow him to invest it in a liquor store. Based on the friend's advice, he invested the money. Of course, as the story goes, he trusted the wrong person. And as he trusted the wrong person, the, the fellow absconded with all the money and the whole family was left back with nothing. All their hopes, all their dreams shriveled like a raisin in the sun. Walter was devastated. He was sorry for what happened. But Benieta was livid and he cursed him with unkind names, unkind words. Finally, the mother interrupted and said, he told the daughter, haven't I taught you to love him? Benieta looked back and says, there's nothing left to love. There's nothing left to love. He destroyed our dreams. He destroyed our hopes. There's nothing left to love. But the mother replied, child, there's always something left to love. And if you ain't learned that, you ain't learned nothing. Did you cry for him and for what this is doing to his soul? When do you think it's time to love somebody? When they are on top of the world? No. It's when they are so low, they can't get themselves up off the ground. You best measure somebody right now and know the valleys they have been through. Measure them right. You see, friends, the perspective of the mother was a perspective that brought life to the family. But the daughter, on the other hand, she had a perspective that only brought death, that only brought despair, that only brought discouragement. Would you write me the first point in your notes, friends? The perspective that you choose will determine whether it brings life or it brings death. The perspective you choose, it will determine whether you bring life or it brings death. You see, you have a choice. You can choose whether what you see, whatever that happens to you, it doesn't matter what happens. You have a choice whether you can see those things and bring it up to a higher state or you can see those things badly and bring it down to a lower state. It is your choice. It, it's, it's like that time, you know. I think by that time, my daughter was about three. I can't remember where we went, but we went to one place where it was quite crowded. There was a lot of people. And suddenly there was something like, there was a show going on, something like... Uh, some kind of like fireworks or something going on in front there. And it was like beautiful, we were all looking. So I, I propped her up on a stone or something so she can see better. And as we were looking at her and Mary, I looked at her, she looked very bored. She wasn't interested at all. And I said, what's going on? 
And so what I did was I knelt myself down to her level. And then I realized, yeah, there's nothing to be great about. All I see was legs and backsides. <laughs> and the moment I picked her up and I carried her, I put her on my shoulder, I carried her up. And when she could see everything, wow, her face lighted up. When she could see above everything else, it was just so beautiful. You see, we have a choice. You can either see things and bring it down to a lower state and only see legs and backside, or you can raise it up above everything else and see what is good and what is beautiful. And that's how life is. But it begins, I mean, it's it's something that we need to learn. Because you see, if you never bring things up to a higher perspective, you will never find victory in your life. You'll never see the promises of God fulfill. You'll never enjoy the abundance life, the full potential that God wants to give to you. You'll never be a person who continuously improves, a person who, who is always upgrading, who is always improving. You'll never enter a season of upgrade in your life. And so it's non-negotiable. We need to improve our perspective. But to do that, to see things to a higher perspective, you have to choose to do so. You have to choose. It doesn't come automatically. You have to choose. But today, we live in a society that is just filled with problems. With, you know, with big problems. You know what? We have too many choices that, be, that choosing becomes such a difficult thing. I didn't realize how much choices we have in the world and how difficult choosing was until in the early part of my marriage when I one day had to go to the supermarket to buy sanitary pads for my wife. Have you ever experienced that? You know, I, at, first, at first, I thought it was a very simple thing. I thought it's just a matter of going there, like buying toilet paper, you know, you just go there, grab something, and that's it. And so I went to the shelf. The sales girl came to me and said, don't worry, don't worry, I know what I'm doing, I can handle it. And so I went to the shelf. And to my horror, the first thing I look, you have dry pads, you have day pads, you have night pads. And then you have heavy day pads, heavy night pads, light flow pads, light flow day pads. You have slim, super slim, ultra slim. You have super absorption, hyper absorption, fast absorption. You have with slim, with wings, ultra slim, without wings. I tell you, I'm looking at all of that. And then the sales girl come again. I told her, no, no, I, I, can, I can handle this. I can handle this. And so I default to my own default mode. Very simple. If I can't figure out what that all means, I'll just find the cheapest packet. <laughs> and so I was there. Okay, this packet looks the cheapest, but eh, this is only a pack of 10. There's a pack of 20. There's a pack of 30s. There's a pack of 50. And I begin calculating in my mind, okay, this amount divided by this amount. And at the whole time, I can see the sales girls and her friend there whispering and looking at me. And after a while, I, I, I begin to see her start walking towards me again. I just grab something and leave. I don't even know what I took. That's life. When you have too many choices, you just don't know what to do. It's like a story was told of this Japanese guy. He went to the US for, a holiday, for, a, for work, for a two months' work, a two months' contract. And so he went to the US. But this problem was, this Japanese guy doesn't speak a word of English. He doesn't speak a word of English. So before he left, he asked his interpreter, what shall, how shall I order food? I need to at least know how to order food, right? So the interpreter said, very simple. I just teach you three words. All you need to learn is hamburger, fries, and cook. Hamburger, fries, and cook. Very simple. So the Japanese guy went to the rich America. First day in the morning, he went to the cafe. cafe. Hamburger, fries, cook. He got hamburger, fries, cook. When he came to lunch, hamburger, fries, cook. When he came to dinner, hamburger, fries, cook. After a week, this guy was just so bored, he couldn't stand it anymore. After a month, he got even worse and he was dying for something. So he called up his interpreter again, give me some, something else to order. And the fellow said, okay, fine. The next time you go to the restaurant, cafe, you ask for bread, eggs, and tea. Bread, eggs, and tea. Okay, fine. So he went to the restaurant, he sat down and he told the waitress. The waitress came, I want bread, eggs and tea. The waitress looked at her and said, okay, do you want white bread, rye bread, pumpernickel bread, wheat whole wheel bread, whole, green, whole grain bread or multi-grain bread? For your eggs, we have omega-3 eggs, Nestle eggs, free range, eight organic eggs. And you, would you like it boiled, half boiled, sunny side up, scramble, poach? For, calf, for tea, we have decaf, we have earl grey, we have, uh, the list goes on and on and on. 
the Japanese guy looked at the waitress and said, hamburger, fries and coke. <laughs> Choices are difficult, right? It's difficult to choose. And what happens was, is this. When we have too many choices, or when it becomes too difficult to choose, what we always end up doing is we choose the easiest thing. We choose the easiest way, the easiest answer. What is most natural, what is most default. We choose the easiest. And when it comes to our perspective, it's not easy to choose to look things at a higher state. It doesn't come naturally. And when we have to choose between looking things at a higher state or bringing things to a lower state, naturally, we will choose to bring things to a lower state. Because it's, it's the easiest thing to do. When I'm feeling depressed, it's easy for me to see things depressed. When I'm feeling discouraged, it's easy for me to see things discouraged. When I'm angry, it's easy for me to see things with anger. When I'm hurt and bitter, it's easy for me to see things that everybody is against me. It's a, that's our default. When it's difficult to choose, we choose what's easiest and we bring things to a lower state. But this morning, friends, if you want to be people of upgrade, people who are always improving in our lives, we need to choose and we need to make the right choice. That's why Jesus, that's why God says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, it says this, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Therefore, choose life. You need to choose life this morning. Because you see, listen carefully. The choices you make, the choices you make, whether you see things to a higher state or a lower state, the choices you make will not only affect you, it will affect your, your family, it will affect your loved ones, it will affect those around you, it will affect your ministry, it will affect your career, it will affect every aspect of your life. It doesn't only affect you. That's why the Bible says, choose life. Choose life. Choose the perspective that would bring life and not death to your soul. Choose to bring things to a higher state. And how do we do that? What are the perspectives that we need in order to get to a higher state? Well, very quickly, there are three, three perspectives that we need to get right this morning. The first perspective, friends, is we need to define our past through the lens of a tutor. We need to define our past through the lens of a tutor. You see, friends, we've all gone through experiences in life what I call life events, the events of life. And all these events shapes us to be what we are today. It shapes us to be what we are today, but you have a choice on how it will shape you, on how it will shape you. It depends on how you look at your perspective of your past. It depends on how you look at your past. Do you see your past as a judge, as an accuser? Because I was like that, that's why I'm being punished. I'm useless now, I'm being punished now. Do you see your past as fate? Oh, because that happened that, not that long ago, I'm destined to be like this forever. Do you see them as a teacher or a mentor? That because this happens to me, to guide me, to teach me, so that I can learn and be what I can be for God. You know the story that was read about David, the scripture passage that was read by dear sister, it's about David. You know, David didn't have a very happy childhood, you know. If you look at the Bible carefully, you look at the story of David. When he grew up, he was a very rejected person. He grew up with a long line of brothers. He was the last of all. And he was always in the background. And when the brothers were all doing the good things, they were all fighting the battle, they were all in the forefront doing things that were getting names and uh, the notable things, the, 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 the in things, and the walking the in crowd, David was at the back tending the sheep. It's like staying at home and doing house chores. When the brothers were out partying and having a good time and building their career, David was left behind. The father never looked up to him. The father always looked at David as nothing great, that he would never surmount to anything. To the point that when Samuel came to the father to ask the father, hey, can I see all your sons? He brought out all his sons and he forgot he got another son, David, outside. You see how insignificant David was to him? He couldn't care less about David. To hit the father, David will never amount to anything. And that's the environment that David grew up with. And some of us, we have those kinds of things that we have to deal with in our past. Maybe you had a difficult childhood. Maybe you were abused when you were a child. Maybe you had to go through problems after problems. Maybe you had a foster family or parents who don't care about you. Maybe you were neglected. Whatever it is that you grew up with, you have a choice. You can be defeated by your past or you can allow it to become a tutor 
You see, friends, if you never reconcile your past, you will never have a right perspective. You'll never be able to bring things up to a higher state if you never reconcile your past. That's what David learned. While David was tending the sheep, and while he was sitting there feeling so rejected and grumbling, probably hurt and, and so sad and depressed, a lion would suddenly come. And David would to wrestle the lion and fight with the lion and kill the lion. And just as the lion was just dead, a bear would, another bear would come. And David had to fight and to kill and to wrestle and kill that bear. And you know, David didn't know what his future hold. But you know, David could have so easily said, God, why are you so terrible? Ah? Here I am being rejected by my family, being looked down by my family. I'm trying to be a good Christian. And then not only that, you nearly got me killed. You send lions to kill me. You send bears to kill me. Why are you so, so, so unloving? Why you don't care about me? Why are you so wretched? Why are you so bad? David could have thought all that. David could have said everything. He had, he had every right in that situation to even behave and to think that way. He could have. But he never interpreted his past that way. Listen to how David interpreted his past. Matthew 70, the same. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this whistle's time. You see, David had a right perspective of his past. He saw his past, he saw the troubles, the difficulties of his past, and he saw that as lessons. He saw that as lessons of faith. He saw those as God training and building up his faith so that he can fulfill God's plans for the future. His past was a tutor. His past was a mentor for him. You see, the problem is, you know, we often remember the wrong things about our past. We often, remember, we often forget the lessons of the past and we remember the pains of the past. Listen carefully. It's not the past events that we remember. It's the pain of the past that we often do, oftentimes remember for too long. And many times, we remember the pain, but we forget the lessons. You know, when it comes to our past, you need to have selective memory. You know what selective memory? It's like this. All of you have photo albums, right? I remember my wife, for years, she was taking a lot of photos. Those old traditional way, one, uh, you take photo, you go to the shop and you develop it, come out 3R, 4R size photos. And those days, you have no choice to select until you develop the photos, right? Those of you who remember, those of you below 20, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Those above, to, above 30s, you know, right? Those type of films. So, my wife used to have tons of it. And one day, I was, I was asking, how are you going to album, put all of those in an album? Very simple. One day, you know what's the solution? She will sit there and she will go through all the photos. This one makes my skin a bit dark. Throw away. This one, my hair a bit not nice. Throw away. This one, my eye got one little dot there. Throw away. This one, ah yeah, got food in my mouth. Throw away. Ah yeah, this one, the background didn't look nice enough. Throw away. Out of 5,000 pictures, narrowed down to maybe 10 pictures that makes her look like a supermodel or a Baywatch, Baywatch babe. And she will file this all up in a nice little album. Ten years later, we will take out the album. Wow. Show, and, show, and show people, see how pretty we looked ten years ago. How beautiful, how slim, how wonderful. And they didn't, and nobody knows that it took a whole garbage load of photos to throw out before you get this best ten. That's what we do, right? I know you guys do that also, all right? So don't, don't just look at me like that. Okay? That's what we do, right? We, will tr we throw the, all the worst photos and we keep the best. But somehow, when it comes to our memories of the past, we do the opposite. We take the ones that's hurting, we take the pain, we take the ones that is worse, and we keep them. And we throw away all the lessons that I learned. Imagine your photo album. Oh, this is when I look fattest. Oh, this is when my, 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 I got saliva dripping down on my cheek. I did, that's the one I keep. Oh, this is the one that my clothes were all wrinkled and dirty. This is the one I keep. Imagine if you have a photo album like that. Anyone has such a photo album? We don't do that. But somehow when it comes to our memories of the past, that's what we do. We throw away the good lessons, the lessons that we can learn, and we keep the pains. But this morning, friends, if you want to have a, a good perspective of your past, you need to reconcile your past. You need to remember the lessons of the past. Let your past be a mentor and a tutor to you and throw away everything else. That's why like 1 Corinthians 1, 10, 11 says, Now all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Things happen is to be a lesson 
for us. There's this lady named Pastor Christine Kane. She was she's a Bible teacher in Hillsong, a pastor, an evangelist. And today, she and her husband started A21 Ministries. It's basically an international organization worldwide that is fighting the cause against human trafficking. And they have a success, they're successfully doing that ministry throughout the world. It's a global ministry today. But it all didn't start then. It started many, many years ago. That when at a very young age, Christine Kane was actually grew up in a very strict Orthodox family. And not only did she grow up in a strict Orthodox family, she grew up sexually abused by the men around her by several men. And she grew up in such a strict orthodox family that everybody keep mum about the event. The loved ones, those who were her, pretend nothing ever happened. Even to the point when finally the, the, the things came to light, the community and the family were so concerned and care, caring about another relative who was sexually abused that the whole family all neglected her, who was also abused by the same people. That was the past that she grew up with. But she testified that all this past didn't, it, it, it could have become, a, it could destroy her. Those past could pull her down, could make her to be a person that has no self-esteem, to make her a person that sees life, that sees everyone as against her. It could make her a person that's just so rejected in life. But she took that past and she allowed that past to be a tutor, to be a mentor, to teach her what it means to, be compa- to have compassion for those, for women who are suffering, for women who have been abused, for women who have been taken advantage of. It, asks, it gives her a compassion for those who are helpless. And with that past as a teacher and a mentor to her, she embarked on this ministry to, to fight human trafficking, a global ministry against human trafficking. That's why Paul says in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal or the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. I forget the things that are behind. I forget the pains of the past. I forget the, the things that hurts me in the past. But I reach on to the goal. I reach on. I press forward. I reach on. And what is it that I reach on? I reach forward to the call of God in Christ Jesus. The call of God is none other than the promises of God. Which you write me the next point of your notes is this, that the next perspective we need to get right is we need to determine our future based on God's promises. We need to have a perspective that sees our future, not based on what our current circumstances are, but to see our future based on the promises of God. If you look at your present circumstances now, you can see hopelessness. You can see it's pathetic. You can see it's terrible. You can see that, you know, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with life. I'm struggling with habits. I'm struggling with uh, situations. I can't seem to have, I can't seem to overcome. I can't seem to find a victory. If you look at your future uh, based on your present, that's all you will see. But if you want to live on a higher perspective, then you need to start seeing your future, not based on your present circumstances, but based on the Word of God, the promises of God. And David knew that. David knew that. He knew the promises of God. Let me read to you 1 Samuel 17. When he came face to face with Goliath, when Goliath came to taunt the armies of Israel, Goliath was a huge, huge giant. And we know the story, right? What happened? David killed Goliath in the end. But when, he, when Goliath came to taunt the armies of Israel, let me read to you 1 Samuel 17, verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, when they saw Goliath, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let me ask you this. Were the Israelites the army of the living God? Do they look like the army of the living God? The Bible tells us they saw Goliath, they were afraid and they were running. They were running helter and skelter, they were hiding in bushes, they were hiding behind rocks, they were fearful. Does that look like the army of a living God? No. But David didn't see that. David didn't look at that. 
David saw the Israelite army based on how God sees them. David saw them based on the perspective of God, based on the promises of God, that no matter what the present situation is, red time, they are the armies of the living God. They are the armies. And David knew that. He knew the promises of God. He knew that God would not abandon the Israelites. He knew, he saw the promises of God, and that's why he was able to face Goliath. He was able to face his Goliath. This morning, friends, if you never have a right perspective of your future, if you do not know what God's future is for you, what God's promises is for you, you will never be able to face the Goliath in your life. You will never be able to overcome the Goliath in your life. But if you focus on the promises of God, then you see the potential that's inside of you. You see the potential of what you can become in God. And that's why Hebrews 12 verse 1 says this, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us run this life. Let us run at this present circumstances, running, looking, not at our situation, but at Jesus Christ and the promises that He has for our lives. Because as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus and His promises, you are on solid ground. Maybe the people in your office always demeans you. Your boss always demeans you. Or you grow up with parents who always call you useless, good for nothing. And you may not feel like that now. But you have to remember that the Word of God says in Psalms 139 that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Maybe you are facing problems and you feel that circumstances are going to drown you. You have to remember that the Word of God says that he who is in you is greater than all that's in the world. Whatever struggles, whatever persecution that you face in the world, he in you is much greater. Even if you don't feel like it, even if you don't see it, that's the promises of God. Maybe you're struggling with old habits. You're struggling with certain habits in your life that you just can't seem to break free. And at this present moment, it just doesn't seem that you will ever break free. But the Word of God reminds you that you are a new creation. All things have passed. All things have become new. But we need to have the promises of God. And that's why, friends, that's why we drum it over and over again. That's why it's so important for you to do your daily devotions. That's why it's so important not just to read the Bible, but to reflect on the Word so that the Word of God will not just go to your head, it will go into your heart. And so that's why we ask you to do your journaling so that when you reflect on the Word of God, the Word of God goes into your heart. And when your Word of God is in your heart, you won't look at your present situation, you won't look at your present circumstances, but you will look to God, you will look at the promises of God, and you will see the things of God. You will see your future based on the Word of God and not your present circumstances. And once you define life's future, once you define your future based on the promises of God, whatever circumstances you see, Whatever you see in life, you will bring it up to a higher perspective. Why? Because the Word of God, because God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And if our future is defined by His perspective, then we lift everything up because it's higher than whatever we are going through. Finally, friends, the third thing that we need to, perspective that we need to deal with, that we need to have, is we need to deal with present situations from the solution side. <coughs> you need to deal with present situations from the solution side. You see, every situation, every difficulty or every problem, there is always two sides to it. It's as though, you know, talk, like, talk about weighing skill, uh, okay? A weighing skill. So you have, there's always two sides to it. There is what we call the problem side of the equation, of the situation, the problem side. And that's what we have is the solution side. And we, the problem is we need, to get, oh, we need to learn to get over, over from this side, from the problem side, to the solution side. Because you see, on the problem side, we focus on the problem. On the solution side, we focus on the solution. Over there, you will never find answers because you, all you're looking at is a problem. Over here, you'll find answers because what you're looking at are the solutions. Over there, you're seeking to fix the blame. You're looking to fix the problem. Over here, you're looking to find solutions. When you're over there, when you're in the problem side of the equation, 
you will stew over it, you will brew over it, it messes you up, it gives you stress, you can't sleep, it gives you constipation. That's the devil's realm. This is where discouragement, despair, hopelessness all lies. On this side of the equation, on this side of the situation, is we, we, is, you know, we don't focus on the blame. Over there, you are looking at who to blame. Whose fault is it? What, who did wrong? Why are we in this situation? Why am I here? How did I end up here? Whose fault is it? Why is it this happening to me? That's the problem side of the equation. And when we delve here too long, that's, what, that's all we focus on. We are focusing on whose fault it is. We are focusing on what, 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 what the problem is. We are focusing on why the problem is so bad. We are focusing on why the problem is getting worse. We are focusing on why, 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 I, why are we not getting out of it. But the moment you move over here to the solution side of the problem, instead of who to blame, it doesn't matter who to blame. You are no Sherlock's. And even if you are, if you find out who to blame, it's not going to help anything. It's not going to help. Over here, you identify the problem, you rectify the problem, you resolve the problem. You, you think on how to fix not the blame, but how to fix the problem. Otherwise, you end up worse and worse. When you are here, you think what is best, how to rectify. And when you are here, when you are here, all the anger, all the bitterness, is not, it doesn't work in this realm. And when you are here, you begin to think clearly, you begin to be more clear-headed. What happens is God begins to infuse you with wisdom and insight, with resourcefulness, with creativity, and you begin to see things better. You begin to see things clearer. This is where miracles happen. This side is where death, condemnation occurs. That side is where miracles happen. It's like Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the ones who seek solutions, who seek peace, who seeks to resolve. Not seek problems, not to focus on the problems, but to focus on the solution. You see, but the problem we have is this. All of us eventually, la, most of us, will eventually move from this side of the equation. We will finally move to that side. Eventually, we will come here. The problem is not whether you finally do come here. The issue is how fast do you get from there to here. See, the problem is many of us, we stay too long on this side. We stay too long here. We stay too long focusing on the blame. We stay too long trying to fix the blame. We stay too long trying to focus on the problem. We stay too long trying to focus on whose fault it is. And we get angry and get bitter and we get frustrated. We stay too long here. The thing that what we need to learn, friends, is we need to move. Once we are here, the minute we know what the problem is, we need to move to this side of the equation. We need to come to this side. But many times we stay there too long. That by the time we come here, things are too bad. Things are too terrible, you are too exhausted, you are too uh, exasperated to, do, to be of any good over here. I can't remember how many times I've, met, I've counseled marital, marriage, marriage counseling. And it always happens. Most marital problems always begin with small issues. Small issues, minor issues. But the problem is, they never come over to this side of the equation. They always remain here. The problems may go away, but they always remain here. Whose blame it is? Whose fault it is? And they always remain here. And they never moved over that side. And, it's, and, 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 the, and the years goes by, small issues after small issues, and sooner or later it becomes irreconcilable differences. Why? Just because they do not move from there to here fast enough. So rather than growing wiser in life, we become more opinionated, we become more religious, we become more critical, but we never move from there to here. I remember a few years back, I was assistant pastor to another pastor, to a senior pastor, and there was one day, uh, he came and he said, okay, for some, I remember it was a ridiculous reason, not, not really good reason, but for some reason, he says, uh, this Sunday, I, I'm not going to preach. I want you to take over. And he, gave, he told me that on Tuesday. Tuesday, And in that, that church that time, 
we closed the bulletin on Wednesday. And I have to prepare my sermon notes and everything by Wednesday. And so in other words, I only had 24 hours to prepare a sermon for that Sunday. And I tell you, when I went, when, when, the minute I got that news, I was angry. I was frustrated. I, you can ask my wife. I went back and I was battering nonstop. This useless fellow, this idiot, blah, 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 you know, all sorts of things. That's why I say, I was, just so, I was just so angry. And I stood there, I stood there for so long, just complaining and whining and even cursing the guy. And I was like, you know, what, what kind of, how irresponsible is he? Blah, 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 blah. You know, give me last minute like that, blah, blah, blah. Purposely want to sabotage me. They want me to, you know, all sorts of things. And immediately, when, and among, among all that much, that, 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 that noises of blame and anger, the Lord just spoke to me and says, you know, if you remain here, if you remain on the problem side, trying to say, trying to figure out why is it that he is so uh, uh, inconsiderate, why is it that, why, you know, I'll keep thinking of a thousand reasons why this shouldn't happen to you. And you keep staying on this side, I can't do anything. I can't use you, says the, the Lord spoke to me. I can't use you. I can't do anything. I can't rectify anything. And the moment I realized that, and I began to move over to the solution side of the problem, okay, fine. I can't do anything about it anymore. I'm stuck with that. I have to come up with a sermon in 24 hours. So what's the solution? What can I do? Okay, I have no control. I can't change that part. So what can I change? What can I do? Well, the first thing I can do is, okay, uh, my dear wife, I'm sorry, I know I don't spend enough time with you, but I really cannot spend any time with you this whole day. I need to lock myself up and just work and work and non-stop. So please, make sure the children don't disturb me, everybody don't disturb me, I'll come back and eat a five minutes lunch and I will go back to work again. That's all. And I can tell the office, okay, I don't want anybody to disturb me, any phone calls come in, pastor not around, pastor unavailable. And so I just locked myself up and I began working. And I worked and I worked and I went, well, okay, fine. Bulletin closed on Wednesday, but the service is only on Sunday. So I can actually do my whole sermon until the whole night, until Wednesday morning, and I can sleep the whole Wednesday. And that's what I did. So I worked the whole night until Wednesday night, until Wednesday morning, handed in the sermon, let them print it out, and I went back and I slept through the whole Wednesday. But that's the end. And because of that, once I was in the solution side of the problem, I was able to resolve it and... I would say, you know, after the service, you know, people were saying, wow, pastor, oh, that was a good, good sermon. Okay, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me clarify this. As a pastor, we know, you know, when people come and shake hands, shake your hand, and they say, pastor, good sermon, you know whether they are saying it as a, as a routine, whether they are saying it very sincerely, or they are saying it as though they were touched and ministered by the Lord. You know that. Okay, that's the gift of discernment that pastors have. All right? And I was telling you, that Sunday, it was like nothing. That Sunday was wonderful. You know, the way that when people were ministered to and when we prayed for the people and when the, people, the people's reaction, it was different. It was different. Why? Because I didn't dwell on the blame side. I didn't dwell on the problem side. I moved to the solution side as fast as I could. In fact, would you write with me your sermon notes, the last part there, as fast as you could. The part there where it says, deal, deal with your present situation from the solution side, put there. On your, in your own, right, own right, right, as fast as possible. As fast as possible. <coughs> in closing, friends, Pastor, very susah. Lah. Want, to become people, want to upgrade our lives. Ah. So difficult. Like you said, it's so much easier. When it's, I, I, it's rather to choose to change the way I look at my past, to choose to to look at my future in God's eyes, to choose to deal with solutions, with situations from the solution side when it's just so much easier to stay on the blame side. Why do I need to go through all that problems? Why do I need to go through the hassle? It's just so difficult. I mean, after all, doesn't God still love me? Even if I don't upgrade, even if I don't improve my perspective, even if I don't improve my life, doesn't God still love me? I mean, after all, I'm still safe, right? I still go to heaven, right? Friends, it's not about whether, you're, whether you are safe or not. It's never about whether God loves you or not. But it's just a matter, it's about whether you will live the fullest life or the fullest potential that God has for you in this life. Whether will you live it out? Will you live life to the fullest potential that God has for you? It's like this. Imagine my daughter has grown up and she's now 20, 26. And she's getting married. This is a wedding day. She's going to get married. And she comes to me, Daddy, 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 I'm finally going to get married today. It's the best husband in the world. Wow, wonderful. But to get married, 
a problem is I need to get a wedding gown. And I need you, daddy, to get me the wedding gown for me. I said, oh, no problem, of course. And they say, the wedding gown costs 1,000 ringgit. And I look at her and I say, uh, we don't want to buy, we just want to rent a wedding gown. Yeah, it costs 1,000 ringgit to rent the wedding gown. Okay, fine. So I rent her a nice white wedding gown with all the, you know, the beautiful, whatever, la, trimming, laces and everything. And then as she was walking to the wedding, on the way to the wedding, for some reason, my daughter has a very uh, strong attraction to mud puddles. When she was young, she likes playing in the mud. And so as she was going to the wedding, she saw a little mud puddle at the side. And somehow, she just couldn't resist that temptation. And she goes into the mud puddle and ba 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 all full of mud. Then she came back to me. Daddy, 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 look what happened to me. Then I look at her and say, what happened? Ay-ya. Do you still love me, daddy? Of course I still love you. Come on, let's get you clean up. Let's get you another wedding gown so that you can still go to your wedding on time. And so we get her clean up, put her on a wedding gown, hug her, kiss her, send her off again. And she went. She goes. And this time she sees another mud puddle even bigger and dirtier and muddier than the first. And the pig in her just couldn't stand it and goes, oi, 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 and she jumps into the mud puddle. And then she comes back again, Daddy, 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 Daddy. Look at me. Look what happened. Do I stop loving her? Of course I love her. I will hug her. I will console her. I will get her another wedding gown and I will send her off again. But friends, this is what happens. If we never learn to lift up our perspective and see life different, we never learn to improve our lives, we will never get to the wedding. We will never reach the wedding. It's not a matter of whether how much I love her. It's not a matter of how much I will restore her, how often I will build her up again. It doesn't matter about all that. The issue is, she will never reach the wedding. She will never get to her wedding. If she keeps going into the mud puddle. And it's likewise, if we never raise our perspective, we will never live life to the fullest blessing that God has in store for us. Instead, we will still be wallowing in the mud day after day after day. So this morning, friends, let us be people of upgrade and let us start by upgrading our perspective. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God, Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And this morning, Lord, we ask for your Spirit to come and fill us. Help us, Lord. Search our hearts. If we have been, always been people who look at things, and we've always been bringing things to a lower state, and we've always been bringing things down to our level, to a lower state, Lord, change our hearts. Help us, Lord, to upgrade our perspective of life so that we will see things they will see our past as a guide, as a tutor to mentor us to be the person you want us to be. So that we will always see our future, not based, not to be defined by our circumstances, but to be defined by your word and your promises. And help us, Lord, to always move from the problem side to the solution side. So that whatever we go through in life, We'll always look at it through the eyes, from the perspective of the solution and never from the perspective of the problem. Help us, Lord. Lord, I just commit each and every one of us unto your hands. Holy Spirit, only you can help us. Help us to choose the choice that will bring life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 